Good morning, church. Last week, we resumed our study of the Gospel of Matthew. After a summer in the book of Zechariah, we jumped back into the Gospel in a pivotal text. Jesus tells his disciples, Many who are first will be last, and the last first. And he says it twice. The second time, it's reordered. So the last will be first, and the first last. I called it Matthew's grace principle. If you read through the Gospel of Matthew with this grace principle in mind, you start to see patterns everywhere. It's embedded in Jesus' teaching, especially the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It's reflected in who Jesus associates with and who he goes to. Not the religious elite or the political leaders in Israel, but fishermen, tax collectors, sinners, Gentiles. Jesus' authority, of course, is constantly on display in the gospel. He shows us time and time again that he is God. He has authority over creation and over sickness and over death and over demons. And yet, he tells us he is gentle and lowly in heart. And he welcomes all to come to him. So last week, the disciples were eager to hear about all the rewards that they might receive for laying everything aside to follow Jesus. They felt like that was only fair. But Jesus corrects their thinking. Eternal life is offered to all those who come to Christ in faith. And so God's definition of fairness is based upon grace, not merit. And this teaching of first, last, last, first really started in earnest in chapter 18. Again, you can see the teaching throughout the Gospel of Matthew, but Jesus makes it explicit in chapters 18, 19, and 20. The disciples asked Jesus in chapter 18, verse 1, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So the whole section is bookended by this idea of greatness. It started in chapter 18, and today's passage is the other bookend. So let's read it together. Open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 20. Stand with me as we read the Word of God. Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 28. Again, Matthew 20, 17 through 28. This is the Word of the Lord. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside And on the way, he said to them, see, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. He said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right and one at your left in your kingdom. Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it's been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Please be seated. Lord, we submit this time to you now as we concentrate on your word. We pray that you would mold and shape us according to your word, make us into the likeness of Christ. Lord, there are many areas in our life that we hide from you, that we don't want you to touch. We pray that you would expose those sin secrets and bring them out, change us by your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 17 starts by moving the narrative along as we see Jesus and the disciples go first up to Jerusalem. No matter what the elevation in Israel, where you were, 
one always went up to Jerusalem. And remember, Jerusalem was the central hub of worship for the Israelites. It was also where the temple was. It was on Mount Zion. So again, one always went up to Jerusalem. Jesus and his disciples were going to Jerusalem. They've been going to Jerusalem for a while now. Jesus started on his path to Jerusalem back in chapter 16 from the far north region of Israel. They're getting pretty close at this point. Next week, we'll see that they're just leaving Jericho, which is only about 25 miles from Jerusalem. Jesus knows that his time is drawing near. So Matthew tells us that Jesus took the 12 disciples aside. This tells us something about the traveling situation that they're in. They're probably part of a large group, a caravan of pilgrims heading to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover from Galilee, heading on the road south. And most likely, this is the large crowd from the beginning of chapter 19. Jesus had many who were following him at this point. So he pulls the 12 aside to talk to them privately. It's only for them. So Matthew gives us a sense that he wants to talk with them while they walk. Jesus tells his disciples, See, we're going up to Jerusalem. And the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Jerusalem is named twice in these three verses. This repetition draws our attention to it. That's what's on Jesus' mind. He's thinking about Jerusalem. They're going up to Jerusalem where everything will take place. Jerusalem was supposed to be this city of praise and worship. Again, the central hub for all of Israel. A place to offer sacrifices and feast with the people of God. But through the next 10 or so days of Jesus' life, it will not be a very joyful place. What are the disciples expecting from Jesus as they approach Jerusalem? What are the disciples expecting from Jesus at this point in his ministry? Well, twice already, Jesus told them that he would be killed and would be raised on the third day. He told them that the first time back in chapter 16. You remember that? Peter had just confessed Jesus to be the Christ, the son of the living God. And then he told them that he would be delivered over to be killed. And Peter got upset when Jesus said this and And Peter rebuked Jesus for saying such a thing. Jesus rebuked him right back with the famous line, get behind me, Satan. The second time Jesus told the disciples about his death was the very next chapter, chapter 17. Although he didn't give them many new details there, one detail he did give them was the use of the title Son of Man for himself. The disciples weren't happy when Jesus told them the second time in chapter 17, either. And while no one made the mistake of rebuking Jesus, they were greatly distressed by the news. And so this third time includes the most detail about what will occur in Jerusalem. Jesus once again uses the title Son of Man, just like his second prediction, which would not have fit with the disciples' expectations of the Son of Man. This was a title lifted from the book of Daniel, specifically Daniel chapter 7, which says that the Son of Man will receive his kingdom. That's what the disciples are expecting at this point in Jesus' ministry as they head to Jerusalem. That's where they're on their way to, the religious and political center of Israel. If Jesus was really the Son of Man, in the sense that Daniel understands it, then he would receive his kingdom in Jerusalem. That's what the disciples are expecting. Despite the fact that Jesus has told them twice already that he would be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes to be killed. So this third prediction includes the most detail about his death. Maybe to help drive this point home. Jesus isn't speaking metaphorically, even if they think he might be. Jesus would be delivered to the religious elite in Israel who would formally condemn him to death under the law. Now, the Jewish religious leaders could condemn someone to death, but they had no right to actually 
put someone to death. Remember, Jerusalem is occupied and directly ruled by Rome at this point. There's not even a puppet king in Jerusalem. That's why Pontius Pilate's there. The Roman governor would be the one who had the authority to condemn someone to death. So Jesus says that he'll be delivered over to the Gentiles, which would be the Romans. I want you to note the humiliation this would have caused for any citizen of Israel. It wasn't enough to be condemned by his own people, but Israel handed their Messiah over to the Gentiles to be killed. And the Messiah wouldn't die just any death. He would die the most humiliating death known in the vast Roman Empire. He would be mocked and flogged and crucified. So there's this startling juxtaposition happening in these verses that we might not quickly pick up on, but that I really want you to notice. It's the same juxtaposition that Jesus made in his second prediction about his death, but now it's, it's heightened because of all this detail. All of this humiliation will happen to the Son of Man. Again, the Son of Man was the title that Daniel the prophet used for the Messiah who receives his glorious kingdom and dominion over all things. This is the person who would be given this righteous kingdom to rule, a glorious, wonderful place. There's no mention of suffering in connection with the Son of Man. But Jesus uses that title to talk about his upcoming death, his upcoming suffering. He's doing this to change the minds of his disciples who are convinced that Jesus will overthrow the Romans and institute the kingdom any day now. They don't realize that Jesus' path to glory first includes suffering and humiliation. The first must become the last so that the last can become the first. And that's exactly what happens. The Son of Man will be raised on the third day. That would have been the most cryptic part of the prediction for the disciples. We know that Jesus is referring to his resurrection. But did the disciples understand it that way? It's hard to know. Probably not from the way they respond. Unlike the first two predictions, though, we aren't told about how the disciples reacted to this news. Though the narrative makes it seem like verses 20 through 28 happen right after this third prediction. So there's something on these verses I want you to meditate upon. Jesus is fully aware of what is going to happen to him when he gets to Jerusalem. He knows every detail. He knows he will be delivered over or betrayed by one of his disciples. He, know, he knows he'll be betrayed into the hands of the religious elite and condemned, though he's never broken the law of God. He knows he'll be humiliated and handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him. And he knows he'll undergo one of the most brutal deaths imaginable. But he still goes up to Jerusalem of his own accord. Why? Why? Why would anyone keep walking? Jesus will tell us by the end of the passage. Let's move on to second, a mother's request. Verse 20 says, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. The sons of Zebedee are the apostles James and John. When both are mentioned in the gospel, they're mentioned like this, the sons of Zebedee. We are not told where they are or how much time has passed between verse 19 and verse 20, but it's safe to assume they're still on the road. Apparently, James and John's mother is part of the large crowd that was following Jesus to Jerusalem. She approaches Jesus with her two sons in tow, and they kneel before him. So far, there's nothing wrong with this. If anything, verse 20 is a grand display of faith. She boldly approaches Jesus and kneels before him, recognizing his authority and treating him like a king. Even the manner of her petition reflects how one might approach a king. She asks if she can ask for something. 
Jesus, as the king in this scenario, has every right to turn her away at this point. But he doesn't. Jesus simply replies, what do you want? And in the ESV, that sounds a bit harsh, as if he's being short with her. What do you want? In the Greek, it's only two words. So the ESV is trying to stick as closely as possible to that. But the NIV is a little bit closer. What is it that you want? Name it. He gives her permission to ask what she's going to ask for. So she says, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. Before we go on, let's talk about James and John's mom. There is some evidence to suggest, and some scholars believe, and I agree with them, that she is actually Jesus' aunt, which makes James and John Jesus' cousins. That might sound a little bit strange, but it all comes down to different lists in the Gospels about what women are at the cross. Okay, so Matthew, Mark, and John all include a list of women who witnessed the death of Christ, who are actually present at the cross. So Matthew 27, verses 55 and 56 says, there were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So two Marys, one is Mary Magdalene, the other is Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, who's most likely Jesus' own mother. The third woman is the mother of the sons of Zebedee, this same lady here. In Mark chapter 15, verse 40, the list is Mary Magdalene, Mary, the son of James the younger, and Joseph, and a lady named Salome. Again, two Marys, the same as Matthew, and a woman named Salome. John chapter 19 verse 25 says, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. So if we compare these lists, the consistent women at the cross are Jesus's mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, and a third woman who we know is not Mary the wife of Clopas because she's married to a man named Zebedee which means she's named Salome. If we look at John's list, the only woman Salome could be is Mary's sister, which means that Salome is Jesus' aunt. Now, I know that's a lot to track with. You might not find this as interesting as I do. You might be thinking, why does this matter? In the Gospel of Mark, though, this same story of James and John approaching Jesus about prominent positions is told, but their mother isn't mentioned. Matthew's relating a historical detail, something true. So what would make a mother of a couple of disciples feel like she could ask Jesus for something like this? This is a bold request. Well, if she's his aunt, and if James and John are his cousins, she might feel like it's well within her right to petition Jesus for these kingdom roles for her precious boys. Now, I don't want to have in your head, I, won't, I don't want you to have a picture in your head of a mother dragging her sons before Jesus, asking him for something that they really don't want. Undoubtedly, James and John put her up to this. Jesus addresses them the rest of the time. I think they lean on her for her familial authority as an aunt. And that's speculation. It's not in the text. But that feels like something that would happen in real life doesn't it? Good old-fashioned nepotism. So let's think through what she's asking for. She wants her sons to sit at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus in his kingdom. And remember, the disciples, and most likely all of Jesus' followers at this point, think Jesus, again, is about to establish his earthly kingdom. They're going to Jerusalem. What else is he going to do? He's the Son of Man. He's going to kick out the Romans. He's going to lead a revolution and establish the throne of David once more. And symbolically, a seat at the right hand of the king was a station of great authority and honor. So in the scriptures, Solomon sets up a throne right next to his throne for his mom, Bathsheba. Jesus, when he ascends into heaven, sits down at the right hand of the father. All of this is supposed to show honor and authority to rule. 
Now, Salome, I'm just going to call her Salome, by the way. Salome is asking for places of great authority for her sons. In this case, the left and the right are equal in authority and honor. There's nothing different about the left. So she kneels before Jesus as if he's king and asks for something pertaining to what she expects to be his immediate earthly kingdom. It's a bold move. And I don't think it could have come at a worse time. Jesus just finished telling his disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem and be crucified. He used that exact detail. Why would James and John do this now? There's an easy answer to that question. James and John and the rest of the disciples still don't quite get what's going on. They don't understand Jesus when he says he's going to die. And maybe they they simply don't believe him. Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says that's true. He even says he's the son of man. The, The son of man receives his kingdom. He's not put to death. Perhaps when they hear Jesus say things like, I'm going up to Jerusalem to be handed over to the Gentiles to die, they interpret it as, when I bring my kingdom soon, we'll suffer some losses in battle. Perhaps they understand Jesus' statement that the Son of Man will be raised on the third day to mean that they will ultimately triumph over the Romans. Maybe it'll take three days. That's speculation, too. But it's truly hard for us reading this to understand how the brothers can make a request like this while Jesus is literally headed to the cross. Have they been listening at all? They're asking to be first in the kingdom. Jesus just spoke to them about this. The first will be last and the last first. It still hasn't clicked. And I love Jesus' response to Salome and the brothers here in verse 22. You do not know what you are asking. That's true. In light of what we know, their request is wild. Jesus turns to James and John and asks, Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And of course, the cup is in reference to suffering and judgment throughout the Old Testament. And in chapter 26, Jesus will ask the Father, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Are you able to drink this cup that I am to drink? And I mean, you got to admire their boldness. They respond, we are able. And that's downright hilarious to me. No second thought about what Jesus might be saying or asking. You can almost hear them responding at the same time, we are able, with a jinx following after. It's a lot like the boldness of Peter when he talks a big game at the Last Supper. Though they all fall away because of you, I will never betray you. Right, Peter. And of course, both James and John also flee the garden. Neither of them drink the exact cup of Jesus at the cross in Jerusalem. James and John talk a big game. If they don't know what cup means here, it's a pretty bold thing to sign up for something you don't understand. But I'm pretty sure they understand what cup means. Before any suffering starts, before they really understand what the suffering of Christ means, they say they're willing to suffer for him. Maybe they think they're signing up for a battle. But that's not the kind of suffering Jesus had in mind. Jesus would be rejected and humiliated and tortured and crucified. Could they really drink that cup? Jesus tells them, you will drink my cup. Whether they are able to or not, they will drink it. Each disciple in turn will suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. James and John are no exception. In fact, James is the very first apostle to be martyred in Acts chapter 12. John is not martyred. He is the last disciple to die. He has to watch all the other apostles die. They will certainly drink the cup. Jesus goes on, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it's for those for whom it's been prepared by my father. Jesus doesn't have the authority to dish out these promotions. 
In his earthly ministry, Jesus submitted himself to the authority of the Father. It's the Father who chooses places of honor in the kingdom. So you might be wondering, well, then who gets to sit at Jesus' right and left? It seems like someone will sit there. Well, last week, we learned that each apostle will receive a throne to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Will there be higher thrones than that with more and greater authority? We don't know. In fact, the point of the passage is that we shouldn't focus on such things. Jesus is right. The brothers don't know what they are asking for. The next time the phrase one at his right and one at his left is used in the Gospel of Matthew, it will be in chapter 27, verse 38, where two robbers are lifted up next to him on the cross. If there's any fulfillment of the right hand and the left hand in the Gospel of Matthew, it is that. The right and the left had been prepared by the Father for a long time. Jesus isn't going to Jerusalem to kick out the Romans and establish an earthly kingdom. He's going to Jerusalem to die. But the disciples, they just, they still don't get it. So what do the sons of Zebedee accomplish with their request? Not much, except to make the other ten pretty upset. Third, twelve prideful disciples. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. Now it's very unlikely that the ten are indignant with James and John because they feel like they asked the question at the wrong time. Or they were being insensitive. So whenever this word indignant is used in Matthew, it's in an unrighteous anger sort of way. The ten are angry because the brothers sidestepped them to get positions in the kingdom that would have been above the rest. Again, Jesus already told them just a few verses ago that they would all receive a throne. James and John are asking for more. And... The brothers, James and John, are well aware of this. They're definitely risking their relationship with the other ten with making this request. Peter has had this place of prominence among the twelve for most of Jesus' ministry. He kind of emerges early on as the spokesperson for the disciples. And maybe James and John are seizing an opportunity here to supplant Peter. Peter keeps saying things that he gets rebuked by Jesus for going all the way back to chapter 16 where Jesus calls him Satan. So maybe James and John are trying to push him aside. After all, James and John, if they are on Jesus' right and left, where does that leave Peter? He's out of the question at that point. And of course, so are the other ten. The rest of the disciples can do the math. They see their positions of prominence come under attack by these two brothers. All 12 have the same mindset. Get as close to Jesus as possible in order to secure honorable positions in the kingdom he's about to establish. This has deafened them to Jesus' teaching about humility and grace. They are operating the way the world operates. But Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. And none of them have realized that yet. So Jesus calls the twelve over to clear the air. He doesn't let them stay mad at each other. He tells them in verse 25, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. And he's talking about Rome here. Rome was a culture of honor and dominance. The strong ruled. It was a top-down authority structure, a strict hierarchy. The rulers demanded allegiance, and the Caesars even demanded worship. If you were great, you showed your greatness through authority. And that's the world the disciples lived in, and it was the only type of kingdom they were familiar with. They assumed Jesus would do something similar when he established his kingdom. But Jesus turns the whole thing on its head. It shall not be so among you, verse 26. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. The disciples are never going to be governors 
military leaders in Jesus' kingdom. Instead, they're going to be apostles of his church. They were supposed, they were not supposed to lead the church like another worldly nation. The church would be different. Do you see the first, last structure in these two verses? You see it? Jesus is repeating the same teaching. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first must be your slave. The last are first, and the first are last. Greatness is not defined by positions of lofty honor and authority. Greatness is defined differently in the kingdom of heaven, and it's defined differently in the church. Greatness is defined by servanthood. If the disciples really wanted to be considered first, then they must become slaves. And did you notice that escalation in terms? Greatness is defined by servanthood and firstness is defined by slavery. The point is not that Christians need to become other people's slaves. The point is that Christians need to lower themselves in their own eyes and consider themselves as nothing more than servants and slaves to each other. Servants and slaves in the Roman Empire were the lowest tier of people. I want you to understand the complete turnaround and change of mind that Jesus is suggesting. The 12 are each trying to figure out how to have the most prestigious place in Jesus' kingdom. They want to be on top. But Jesus says that their definition of firstness and greatness when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, that it's completely backward. If they want to be great, they have to become the least. Not just in their own minds and hearts, but actually. They have to become like servants. There's no vying for authority in the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven, everything operates on the grace principle. God mercifully gives as he desires. There's no merit. There's no deserving it. No one deserves to be Jesus' number two. What a silly thing to think. In the kingdom, greatness is defined by quiet, consistent, faithful service. When we get to heaven, we will be surprised by those who hold places of honor. In our minds, the great thinkers and pastors and evangelists will have those places. Maybe some of them will. But we'll be surprised to find that the meek actually do inherit the earth that the persecuted will receive the kingdom of heaven, that the poor in spirit will be rich there. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, a bunch of people who are in hell get a chance to check out the outer fringes of heaven. And some who live in heaven come from the deeper parts of heaven to come meet them and try to convince them to join them, and almost no one takes them up on it. It's a fiction book, by the way. Don't get caught up in the doctrine here. There's a scene near the end of the book when Lewis sees this, who's part of the narrative, by the way, coming from hell. He sees this woman in like glorious dress being paraded around and joined by other spirits who are singing and dancing around her. And she's, again, dressed beautifully. And it's this splendid vision of this woman. And she lives in heaven and has received all of this honor and glory there. And Lewis thinks he might know her, that it's someone famous, but a friend who's with him corrects him. Let me read you just a small portion. Is it? Is it? I whispered to my guide. Not at all, he said. It's someone you've never heard of. Her name on earth was Sarah Smith, and she lived at Golders Green. She seems to be, well, a a person of particular importance. Yeah, she's one of the great ones. You've heard that fame in this country and fame on earth are two quite different things. Come to find out the parade of other spirits with her are the many boys and girls that she led to Christ through her evangelism out of her back door because of her kindness. I think Lewis understands Matthew's grace principle. Greatness in the kingdom is not domination or the power to make decisions. Greatness is service to others. Greatness is loving others. Why is the kingdom of heaven so different? Because it's built upon the example of Jesus. He tells his disciples that they must be like servants and slaves because 
The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The disciples are supposed to look like servants because they're supposed to look like Christ. Christ did not come to be another earthly king. He was not a better Caesar. He came, to over, came not to overthrow Rome, but he came to overthrow the powers of sin and darkness. And he did that through his death and through his resurrection. The Son of Man, and notice that title again, became a servant and a ransom payment on the cross. Earlier we asked, why would Jesus knowingly go to Jerusalem if he knew all this bad stuff was going to happen to him? And this is exactly why. It was his mission to be a ransom for many. And this language is lifted right from Isaiah chapter 53. He is our substitute. Upon him was our chastisement. We could not pay the penalty for our own sin, but Jesus paid it for us. He willingly goes to Jerusalem to, to suffering and death in order to bring us back into right relationship with God. And he ransomed us from sin and death, from wrath and judgment. And he's redeemed us for himself. Praise the Lord. Jesus is a ransom for you. But throughout the gospel, we've consistently seen that he's a servant too. Jesus has constantly given himself to people. He's healed them. He's fed them. He's raised people from the dead. Jesus did not lead a military revolution. He offered himself as payment for sin. That was his mission. And if we would be truly great in the kingdom, we must be like Jesus. We should be servants to each other, outdoing one another in honor, loving one another as best as we can, actively. Only Jesus is a ransom for sins, our substitution on the cross, but we're called to picture him in our servanthood every day. This is hard because we live in a very similar world to James and John where selfish ambition is the name of the game. Jesus is calling his, his followers to a higher calling here. And it has real world implications. All Christians are called to image Jesus and how they relate to one another. Living out this grace principle. They're to be servants. They're to do to others as they wish others would do to them. Actively. Jesus humbled himself to the point of death on the cross, and yet we have such a hard time humbling ourselves. Would you serve in a position faithfully if you knew you'd never get recognized for it? Do we tend to see serving others as a means to an end, to praise or more power or even wealth? The disciples are prideful. They want what's best for themselves and they think they deserve it. Pride is at the heart of a person who desires positions of power and authority for glory's sake. And we should be wary of such persons. And more than just the church, in every aspect of our life. And if we say, sense that same selfish ambition in our own hearts, we need to repent. Selfish ambition is a sin before the Lord. We should desire God's kingdom to flourish over ourselves. That might be a hard thing to say amen to, but can I get an amen? amen. Actively living that out is difficult. And it has implications for how you treat other people in real life, like what you write on Facebook. If you want to see others suffer so that your side can succeed, that's selfish ambition. If you don't want the good of all people in Christ and you want to see your side win so that you can receive glory, that's selfish ambition. Do you, do you hear other implications here? from maybe things we're doing in November? As you see people who are so heavily influenced by prideful, selfish ambition, be careful. They might not have people's best interests in mind. We need to do things in wisdom. Amen? 
Jesus humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. He was the king of the universe. He is the king of the universe. And yet, he had no touch of selfish ambition at all. He had no right to claim a throne at that moment. He went to the cross willingly. He knew that was his goal. That is the person we look to as king of all things. Amen? That's who we emulate in our everyday life. Who the Holy Spirit is molding us into every day. Christians are not supposed to be like the world when it comes to selfish ambition. Even though it's really tempting. It's very tempting to be like the world here. It feels good, doesn't it? To see your side win. We're not supposed to be like that. We're supposed to be like Christ. Service and sacrifice are marks of greatness in the kingdom of heaven. Are you great? The way God reckons greatness? Through love and service? The desire to see those around you flourish? May the Lord give us each a desire to be great in that way. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, you are great. And we want to see you magnified. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your greatness that we get to reflect on. Lord Jesus, we know that being great, you came and humbled yourself to the point of death on a a cross. Lord, that you were our ransom. Father, it's hard for us to fathom that someone so great would lower themselves to that point for others. Show us how to do that, Lord. Teach us by your Spirit. Show us the different ways in our lives that we are not doing that. Make it clear. We want to live like you. In Jesus' name, amen.